We sing our opening hymn this morning. This is Communion Sunday, so we're going to be singing Break Thou the Bread of Life. Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me. As thou didst break the loaf beside the sea, me on the sacred page I seek for this morning from 1 Chronicles 16, 8, and 9. O give, give thanks, thanks to the Lord, call upon, upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works. 1 Chronicles 16, 8, and 9. Let us pray bread together on our knees. 
Let us break bread together on our knees. When I fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun, oh Lord, have mercy on me. Let us drink the cup together on our knees. Let us drink the cup together on our knees. When I fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun, Oh, Lord, have mercy on me. Let us praise God together on our knees. Let us praise God together on our knees. When I fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun, oh Lord, have mercy on me. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, Thank you. You may be seated. Well, good morning. It is so good to be back with you. Some of you may be aware of the last couple of weeks, I haven't been around. Um, I was over in Payette at one of our sister churches, and I had the privilege of bringing the message to them for the last couple of weeks. They are right on the brink of having their new pastor start. I think he's actually moved and landed, he and his wife. Uh, I think he begins actually next next week. But the past two weeks, I've gone over there and, and just supported them by sharing the message. Um, we took about four months to go through the book of Ephesians. At Payette, I took two Sundays. But I'm kind of a walkthrough guy, so we kind of did a quick walkthrough through the uh, book of, uh, of Ephesians. But, uh, but I've been around, and I'm back, and it's just good. I missed... Missed being here, missed being with all of you. So I'm kind of making up for it. We started a, a service last night. So I was in church last night here and again this morning. And uh, for some of you who have been wondering, uh, we did launch our Saturday night service. It's called a soft lunch. We're still, or launch, lunch. <laughs> a soft lunch in the month of August as we kind of hone off some of the red edges, try a few things out. We're looking for people to kind of share some, some thoughts. You see a couple of Pictures up there from last night. We had about 45, maybe 48 of us show up here. Mostly people from our congregation are back here this morning. Uh, in the next few weeks, and, and by the 1st of September, we'll be doing a lot more publicity, uh, getting the word out much broader. But we wanted to kind of take a few weeks just to work out some bugs and just make sure we had, uh, had it together. Please understand, this is not a new church plant. It's not a church group that we're starting. This is just another service. It is a part of Caldwell First Baptist Church. It's CFBC Saturday night. We call it Refresh. We'll see if we hang on to that title, if it works. Some of the things we're trying to focus on, uh, kind of a grid we created to, to evaluate ideas. We want it to be worshipful. We want it to be authentic. Uh, we want it to be welcoming. For those who may, may, haven't been, may not have been around the church for a while, we want it to be welcoming. 
Uh, but it is all the way through and through Caldwell First Baptist Church. And so I enjoyed it last night. And I certainly welcome any of you to come and check us out, check it out, see how, how it sounds and fits and, and that. But more than just come check it out, I want to ask you to do us a favor. Do me a favor. Think of someone you know that might appreciate our Saturday night service. Invite them to come attend. Invite them to come and uh, see if that's a good fit for them. You may know someone who's just a neighbor who hasn't been to church before. Maybe it's somebody new to our community. Maybe it's someone who hasn't been around for a while. But consider inviting them to come and, and join in. One of the priorities last night as well as this morning is connection. And so afterwards, we spend some time just encouraging people to, to visit and get to know each other. But this morning, we want to take some time to greet. So I'm encouraging you to stand up. Find somebody you don't know, welcome them, greet, with, greet them as we begin our service today. Good morning. It is the first Sunday of August here at Caldwell First Baptist Church, and we want to welcome you. We want to welcome you to our worship service today, and today we have Jim Eisentrager. He's a principal at... Nampa Christian School. He's also a member of our congregation and part of our preaching team, and he'll be bringing the message. So grab your Bibles, have them handy, and we just welcome you to our church family service this morning. Our verse of the month, it's coming, folks. There we go. There we go. Let's share God's word together. Isaiah 26, 3 through 4. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. Isaiah 26. Three through four. Please be seated. Well, good morning. Is this on? Okay. Good morning. I'm glad you guys could find your way to church this morning through the fog. And uh, we appreciate you being here this morning. And if you're a newcomer today, we welcome you especially. And uh, if you haven't stopped by the Welcome Center, which is right down in the lobby at the end of this aisle right here. Please do that today because we have a special gift for you today. So stop by and get that. And we would like you right now to register your attendance, if you would. And those who are on the outside aisle, if you would just pass the registration pads uh, across the pew so everybody can register their attendance. And if you would like to uh, write a prayer request on this sheet, you can do that. Or if you'd like, a, make a, if you'd like to make a comment to the to the uh, church staff or 
Anything else, you can write that on the back of the uh, registration sheet for us. Thank you. Well, middle schoolers, we would like you to join us this Monday through Wednesday for a fun-filled time of games. And starting at 9 a.m. here at, uh, at First Baptist Church, and that's at 9 a.m. Monday through Wednesday this week. And also next week, this is a fun time, it's Rodeo Sunday, and Western wear is highly encouraged to wear that. And uh, so if you've got your uh, cowboy boots or, or your, uh, your hat, even John, I think, is going to be wearing a cowboy hat at Rodeo Sunday. That's not a cowboy hat. <laughs> My goodness. Thanks, John. Well, we would like you to invite your friends and family for a great morning service followed by a baked potato uh, bar luncheon downstairs. And uh, we have music uh, during that service that's going to be featured by Betty Adams and uh, Nelson Wilson and, Wilson and Aaron and Melissa Wiles. Uh, you won't want to miss it. And we, we will see you all there. So everybody come, enjoy the time. See you all there. Uh, the Mug and Muffin is this Saturday at 10 a.m. for all ladies. And uh, we'd like you to come and join us as we prepare to uh, prepare welcome baskets for the international students uh, coming to the College of Idaho uh, this fall. That'll be a fun thing to do. Men's camp is coming on September 15th through 17th at Warm Lake Camp. This is a really special time, men. Uh, if you haven't gone to this, uh, set this date aside. If you can, come up for a day or two or the whole weekend. Uh, this is really a special time. Uh, to spend with other men and, and to share together. I would say that uh, truthfully. Also, please mark your calendars for the uh, Fall Wounds Retreat. Uh, it's happening, coming up on October 13th through 15th at the uh, Nazarene, Na, excuse me, Naz Nazareth Retreat Center in Boise. Now, I think we have another announcement by, is Peggy going to give us announcements? Or John? Okay, all right. Well, one thing I wanted to share with you is, they say a picture's worth a thousand words, so maybe my image here will help. Um, I don't usually come up here listening to myself through this, but I wanted you all to grasp, uh, we have uh, purchased a system which allows uh, little units like this to enhance the sound for some of us, some of our folks who uh, may have a little bit of difficulty hearing our, our, our services. And so, if you fall into that category, check back with the welcome booth and let them know. We bought a, a base unit and some, I think about four or five of these specific units. Um, it's nice if you bring your own headphones. Your own headphones will just plug right in, but the value to that is it, it doesn't create such a, uh, uh, a cleanliness issue where we're having different people use them. And so, anyway, these are going to be available by next Sunday. I've got at least one fellow trying them out today just to see how well they work. But uh, we're excited because we want to encourage and help everybody to be able to hear the service well. So we just wanted to let you know about that. Um, our Missionaries of the Week is Lifeline Pregnancy Center and also Eric and Adriana Lape. And so if you want, uh, their email addresses are in the bulletin. Uh, send them a quick note. And if you'd like to send them a letter, uh, we'd appreciate that. I know people out in the field certainly appreciate hearing from our church and from our congregation. So if you'd like to write, write a letter to him, just raise your hand and Jim will get that to you. Ah, it's the first Sunday of the month. The month. We have a lot going on today. Peg will be coming up and sharing a children's sermon in just a few moments. Uh, also, at the very end of our service today, uh, Carl Bauman from the search committee will be coming up and giving us a short update. And so it's a, a full service. So as the men come forward for the offering, uh, let's just take a moment and go to prayer. Father, we do thank you. It is always a privilege for us to come, to be here, to worship you. Father, we need to be those people whose eyes are on you and our trust is in you. So Lord, work in our hearts, speak to us. Allow us to examine ourselves, examine our lives, that we could, our lives would be honoring to you, that we could live up to the calling. Father, today we want to lift up Lifeline Pregnancy Center. We want to 
lift up the Lapes. Today, specifically bring them to before you, Father, as an organization and individuals who give of themselves to serve you, to share the message of Christ to those who are hurting, to those who are in need. So today, Lord, give them a sense of your peace and your, your strength and your presence in all things. Give them your direction. Father, we are so thankful that you continue to watch over our congregation on a daily basis that you have continued to strengthen our body and bring us together. Father, we are thankful for the launch of our Saturday night service, and we pray that that might be a vehicle that Caldwell First Baptist could reach out to additional people and share your message with them and allow people to come and to worship you and to be drawn close to you. Father, today we want to give back a portion of what you have blessed us with. And so, Lord, we just ask that you would accept our humble Gifts today, use them for our, your purposes to further your kingdom. In all of these things, we thank you and honor you. In Jesus' name. Okay, if we could have our kids come up front for a short time together. You're the winner, Landon. <laughs> Here, why don't you help me? Can you give everybody one of those? Oops. 
Hey, Alyssa. Hi, Carter. So we're passing out a piece of paper. I'm going to take one of those, Landon. Can you make sure everybody gets one? I'll show everybody what it looks like. It's a picture of a wasp. I believe this particular wasp is a mud dauber wasp. But we're going to talk a little bit today about wasps. So when I say the, when you think about a wasp, what does that make you think of? What do you think about of wasp theme? It stings, yeah. Do you think how beautiful they are? Do you ever think how beautiful they are? It looks like a bee. They're kind of like a bee in the same family. What else? What else do you think? Yeah, it has six legs. Yeah. has really pretty wings, and some of them are really pretty, don't you think? But mostly, what do we think when we think of a wasp? We think how scary they are, and we want to get away from them. And why is that? Because they might sting us. Yeah, because they might sting us. Because with a wasp, unlike other kinds of bees, if you bother him, what does he do? He kind of comes after you. It feels like that, doesn't it? It feels like he comes after you, and he's going to get you and sting you. So they're kind of scary. Yeah. They seem angry, don't you think? Wasps always seem a little bit angry, and if you bother their nest, they get really angry and they come after you. Yeah, so what do we do when we're trying to get rid of wasps? We get those cans so we can stand like 20 feet away and spray their nest and not get too close so they don't come after us and sting us. Well, do you ever think about sometimes when we get angry, how maybe the way we act or what we say could actually hurt, kind of like the sting of a wasp? Yeah? Sometimes we get angry at our brother or sister or mom or dad or maybe even our friend. We get angry at them because of all kinds of different things. And then sometimes we do angry things. We throw stuff or we say unkind words. We might push. And that can hurt too. So in the Bible, it talks a lot about anger. And there's a verse at the bottom of your sheet here. It's from Psalm 103.8, and it says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger. He's abounding in love. And I think that we need to remember that God tells us to be slow to anger. And so we're supposed to have that kind of low boiling point, not let that boil over and get angry really quickly, because we're supposed to focus on love. Okay? So I want you to think about, and when you take these sheets back to your seats and you color this wasp make him really pretty okay but i want you to think about the fact that we don't want to be like a wasp we want to be loving and compassionate and we want to be slow to get angry okay so think to yourself i don't want to be like a wasp can you say that i don't want to be like a wasp I want to be slow to anger. What happens if we were fast? Well, then you get angry really fast and you might say something that you regret. You might hurt somebody's feelings. Yeah. Yelling. Yeah, that's right, Alyssa. Okay. You guys can go back to your seats. Did everybody get a sheet? Okay. Good job. John runs over and slaps him in the arm and goes, you get to follow that. Good luck. <laughs> oh, no pressure. No pressure. Good morning. Glad to have you here this morning. And uh, it's a privilege and an honor to be able to bring the message to you this morning. Um, I had the <clears throat> great opportunity of opening uh, Refresh last night. And uh, and it was, I was real appreciative to let... Uh, 
have Aaron and Melissa ask me if I would come and share my testimony, and so um, I did that last night and had a wonderful, wonderful time, and I pray that God uh, will continue to to bless um, that Saturday evening service and that it will continue to minister to those that can't make it on Sunday mornings or to people that are a little bit uh, intimidated sometimes by the formalness of church or, or whatever it is that keeps people away um, that that Saturday night service can really uh, draw that down and, and have an attraction there. We've got a full morning this morning, so um, I get to be pretty talkative sometimes, so is it okay if I just kind of jump right in? All right. I know it's not normal, it's not strange, I'm sure I'll find some story to tell halfway through here that's not in the notes or some way to embellish it, but if you would, would you open your Bibles with me please to Acts chapter 4, to Acts chapter 4, and while you're turning there, I'm going to just kind of clue you into to what, uh, why we're here today. You know, I... I <laughs> I've told people and I've told you before that it was probably the nine years of teaching middle school that balded me, Um, but that's not the real story. Have you ever been walking through life and God just kind of comes down and he just kind of like whaps you upside the head? You know, you're like, whoa, this is something I've never even really thought of before. I've, I've been introduced with some concept. That's what happened. That's really what happened. God has hit me so much over my life that he smacked the hair off the top of my head. And it was one of those instances about two weeks ago, sitting in church right back there, that God goes, Kapush! and he goes, you need to talk on that. And um, it was actually, it was, it was something that Nate was saying and, and, and a concept he was talking about during um, his youth Sunday when we were going on camp. And, and it's just, it's great how God gives those things to you. Because I knew that my time up here was coming and I was, in prayerful consideration about what topic God would want me to, to speak on or, or, or preach about. And, and all of a sudden, there it was. And so that's the message that uh, I'm going to bring um, to you this morning. So you should be in Acts chapter 4. I'd like to read a little bit of a section, uh, verses 4 through 12 to you, kind of give you the basis of what we're at, and then we're going to dive right on into it. So follow along with me as we read verses chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. The title in the section says Peter and John before the Sanhedrin. Just give a little bit of a backstory here so that you know. In the previous chapter, chapter 3, Peter and John were walking into the city of Jerusalem and there was a lame beggar that used to get carried to the gate and would be laid there and he would ask money for from all the people that would walk that would walk into the um, into the city through that particular gate. And he was a common, a regular fixture there. People knew who he was. And he grabbed the attention of these two, and they ended up healing him. And, um, and so the leaders in Jerusalem had some questions about that. So that's where the backstory is. And so here we go. Chapter 4, verse 1 says, The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put him in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and other of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is, and he quotes the Old, Old Testament here, the stone the builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. It was the using of the word cornerstone that when I heard that from Nate, that God is like, bam. I went home and I looked up this passage and I was struck by the, the intensity 
and the purposefulness of the words in verses 10 through 12, but specifically through verse 12, where it says, it is this cornerstone, it is this foundational truth, and I'm here to tell you this morning, ladies and gentlemen, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. It is the name of Jesus Christ. Amen? So I began to put this together and wondered, how can I present this? Because we know that. And I want to reinforce that concept to you this morning. But how can I put this together in, in an engaging way? I have a friend of mine. He's actually uh, a dad of some of my kids at school. Well, not my kids. They'll soon be my kids. They're a little bit younger. And he is a builder. He builds custom homes for a living. And so I went to him and I said, I need a favor from you. I'm going to film you. To which most anybody would say, absolutely not, no way. And he did. No, he didn't. He said, I'd help you out, but he's nervous about it. I said, you're going to do fine. What do you want me to do? I want you to talk with me about building homes. Okay? And I said, I'm going to film you. Can you do that? Can you talk to me about building homes? I said, I'll stand behind the camera. I'm going to ask you some questions. You just, you just answer my questions. And that's what I did. I stood behind the camera, um, and I asked him some questions, and I put together this little video. And I'm going to show you this video here. And as we watch this video, there are some things that I want you to listen specifically for and to listen how Chip describes the construction process when building he builds custom homes, but the principles are going to apply for any kind of a construction project. Okay? The first thing I want you to listen for is listen to his description of the necessity of a solid foundation. Okay? Listen to how he talks about th that, how important that is, that when adversity comes and things come against that foundation, or if something like a house begins to settle, what does having a good solid foundation do? That's the first thing. Second of all, I'd like you to listen for the importance of having a square foundation. How a foundation is set at 90 degree angles, and if it's off, what kind of problems do that, does that create, both at the beginning level and then as you build higher up? Thirdly, I'd like you to listen for the concept of what he talks about when, let's say you don't have a square foundation and you build up, what, what are the costs that are involved in either tearing it down and the costs that are involved that are rebuilding? And then finally, I'd like you to listen for the concept that he talks about of um, uh, how further away from the foundation you get when something is not square, how bigger the mess becomes to fix it. Okay? So let's watch this short video as Chip talks about building a house. My name is Chip Kinsler, and I own a company here in Nampa called Kinsler Builders and Development. I build custom homes. I've been building for about 20 years. You have to start with a solid square foundation to make everything else in the house fit properly and to work as a unit that it's supposed to work as. When you have a foundation that's solid, everything that you build builds upon that and when you have a crumbling foundation when you try to build on that the parts that are being built on top of that crumbling foundation are going to crumble as well in time it won't happen overnight but it will happen when there's adversity in that structure when that structure is taking on different types of weather and if the earth moves just a little bit and the house settles if you have a strong foundation that strong foundation is going to hold that house up to that settling but if you have a weak foundation you're going to have cracking throughout the entire house and we all know that there is adversity in everything that we do and that comes along with construction that comes along with every job that a person would have and we have to build the base strong. It's critical to have the foundation square from, from the time that it's poured because once concrete is poured, it is solid, and the only way to 
to change it is to tear it out and redo it. So if the foundation is not square and the framers start to frame on it, they can fudge just a little bit to try to square that up. But what happens is you get the walls on top of the floor and it's not square. And then you try to set the doors and the windows in something that's not square and nothing works quite right. You can get by, but getting by in construction is just not my forte. We want it to be square from the get-go, from the very beginning, so when we build on it, everything is lined up and all the parts and the pieces of the house go together smoothly. It will go out from, a, from an unsquare foundation to an unsquare floor to an unsquare room to an unsquare roof system on your house and it just multiplies as you go. So the further you get in the process, the worse it gets because the foundation was out of square. It's so critical to get that just right at the beginning. Well, you could use the analogy of how much do you have to peel back to get to the root of the problem? And the root of the problem is really the foundation. And to get that house to be right, even though it's built already on an unsquare foundation, you have to go all the way back down to the foundation if you want to build it square. So once you have an unsquare foundation, it's impossible to take that and make it square without going all the way to the root and fixing it from the bottom up. You know, and the further you get along in the process, the more costly it gets. If you put a foundation in, and for some reason the contractor that was putting the foundation in didn't do a square job, the cheapest time to ever fix that foundation is right then and there. If you figure out that foundation is out of square before you do anything else on it, that's the time that you just want to tear it out and start over. If you build the floor, and you build the walls and you build the roof on top of that, you're compounding every part of the construction onto that unsquare foundation. And if you want to take that apart, one piece at a time, from the roof to the walls to the floor down to the foundation, it's compounded just like, you know, just like any problem. The further you get from the source, the bigger the problem is going to be. Principle is incredible. You know, I, I just went to him, I said, talk to me about a house. Talk to me about building a house. And in my head, I had the concept of Christ as a cornerstone. And as I listened to him talk, I went, man, this is crazy. He's building my sermon for me. This is awesome. Maybe I should step down and just have him come and, and, and talk about it. But, but that's where I want to go this morning. Within the context of building a house, and the four principles that I asked you to listen for that you heard in that video, I'd like to talk with you this morning, and I'd like to just make some comparisons in our lives, in my life, um, about building a house and those four principles. The first one I asked you to look at and, and listen for was the importance when you build a house to have a solid, strong foundation. That foundation in our lives is Jesus Christ. From the moment that we ask Christ into our hearts and we begin our personal relationship with Him, we begin building on an already solid, strong foundation. The kind of foundation that already has stead, stood the test of time. The kind of foundation that um, is already tried and tested and true is the foundation of Jesus Christ. The Bible talks in a number of places um, about what that solid foundation in Christ is. In Romans 10, verses 9-10, through 10, it says, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. That foundational aspect of coming to Christ is already set for you. 
Ephesians 1, chapter 13 and 14 says, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in with Him, a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who was a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. Christ is that firm foundation for us, already set and ready to go. But the interesting thing is, is as you look around the world today, there are small little things that are feeding into our lives and into our culture and into the lives of our children and into ourselves that would suggest that maybe that's not the real case. Take, for instance, this quote that I found online. This is interesting. I found this on a website called Religious Tolerance. Okay? Well, that sounds kind of interesting, right? You know, religious tolerance. And and, and the, the author, Grace Lee, says this, I think that every single person who has ever walked this earth, no matter what their faith or nationality, can agree on one thing. People are different. You know, you start out reading that, and you're like, I don't have anything really to disagree about that with, right? I mean, nobody in here looks like me, thank goodness. All right? And so you you begin reading this quote, and you're like, okay, yeah. So she starts off on a nice, strong point. Maybe this is something I can get on board with. And, And I don't know how it works for you, but man, I've seen areas in my life when I read something at the first onset that I don't necessarily disagree with, then maybe there can be truth to be found somewhere in there, and I have to figure out what that truth is going to be. But keep reading. Listen to this. I am different from my next door neighbor who is different from her teacher who in turn is different from his pastor. At the very least, all human beings are physically different. Still nothing, right? Looks like we're off to a good start. But we also have a psychological and emotional differences in how we function, how we react to the world and how we think. Again, we're still kind of trucking right along. Therefore, if one believes in the idea of God and in salvation, there should be different ways of reaching a level of salvation. Enlightenment. Whatever you believe in, I find it rather difficult to comprehend the common belief that one religion, one path, is the way to salvation. A religious leader shouldn't preach the exact same path or way to salvation for all his listeners any more than a doctor should prescribe the exact same medication to all of his patients. It's important to have faith in what you happen to believe in, but it's also important to show tolerance, if not respect for the faith of others says Grace Lee. So here we have something we start off with. It sounds, I don't disagree with that. But if you don't keep your guard up, by the time you read through, you're left with yourself wondering, okay, now maybe there'll be some things in there I don't agree with. Maybe there's some things that I are. How do I begin to mesh those together? And ladies and gentlemen, this is what we're inundated with in our culture today. We're inundated with things that we do agree with, things that maybe we don't agree with, but then we're told in order to have religious tolerance or in order to have common connection with all of us, we have to be able to learn how to get along. And we begin to chip away at that solid foundation that was Christ. And we begin to insert things into our lives that we may try to, in the name of tolerance or in the name of not hurting anybody's feelings or in the name of not doing anything to offend someone, we begin to allow these things to come into our lives. And I'm here today to call us back to something greater. To call us back to the solid foundation of Jesus Christ. That if it doesn't mesh with what the Bible says, then you have to throw it out. Do you see that bumper sticker? On all the cars, not all the cars, that's, can't say it, but on a lot of the cars that says coexist and it's made out of the symbols of all the different religions, that thing drives me nuts. And what drives me nuts even more was the time that I saw someone who professes to be a Christ follower have that on the back of their car. Because at that moment, that person has allowed their structure to be compromised. She says in here that pastors, me, shouldn't be teaching their people that there was one way, one path to salvation any more than a doctor should prescribe the exact same medication to all of his patients. I'm sorry, Grace, I completely disagree with you. I will preach to you 
one path to salvation in through Jesus Christ. And that is what I believe in. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. He said it in Luke chapter 6, verses 46 through 48. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I'm going to show you what they're like. They're like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid that foundation on rock. When a flood came and a torrent struck that house, could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment that torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. Right now, all of us can think of examples in our lives of people who maybe started out They started on the solid foundation but began to build their house. And then when the torrent struck, maybe they sacrificed on on the integrity of some of the building materials or sacrificed on some of the integrity of what they believe in the name of not hurting someone's feelings. And, and, And as things go, we'll get here in a minute, but as things go, things tend to get, Chip said, exponentially worse the further you go. We have to make sure that we look at everything that comes our way through that biblical lens of Jesus Christ. When you watch TV, when you read the newspaper, when you interact with your friends, when you have conversations about Christ or religion with those in your life, is everything done through that biblical lens of Jesus Christ as the solid foundation? Number two, Chip said you must have a square foundation. Not only must it be solid, but it's got to be square too. I don't know what kind of construction experience you have. I I, honestly, I really don't have much to be able to, you know, practical points here. But I know that Nate Pickens does. I know there are many others of you in here who have construction backgrounds, built a house, trying to put in a window or trying to put in a door or try to lay down some laminate flooring. My first house that I had, uh, that I when I moved out from my parents' house, I bought in Caldwell here. It was one of those Hubble homes. It probably went up in about 36 hours. I remember after the few years living there, the coming in from the garage, the door in from the garage into the house, you know, it attracts a lot of dirt, and the carpet that was there was light-colored carpet, and it began to get soiled and dirty. And so I thought to myself one day, self, um, you know, you can do this. Let's rip out that carpet and just take a few square feet. I think it was only about 15 square feet. It was really short. And let's just lay down some laminate flooring, okay? That'll kind of help keep that out. So I started out one day and I didn't know what I was doing. I seriously, I did not. I just took a box knife and started cutting carpet. I thought, but you, you, you're, you're a man now, right? You can figure this out. Yeah. We'll get her going. So I just took that box knife and rip and I just went, woo. And I ripped that carpet right up out of the entryway. And that went pretty smooth. I went, all right, good stuff. I think I'm moving right along. So I ripped up the, uh, Foamy stuff that's underneath. That's just what it's called. Foamy stuff. And, it, and, and, and I don't know who the staple happy guy was that decided every half square inch you needed a staple like that stuff was going to get up and walk away. So I spent the days on my knees pulling those staples out because, you know, you ripped up the foamy stuff and there's little foamy dots everywhere with a little silver staple in the middle. (laughs) And I love this. This is technical. I got all those up. By the way, as you're doing your construction process and you're up walking around in your bare feet in the middle of the night because you hear a noise or something, don't walk right to the edge of the wall. Because some guy who thought it was important took a strip of wood and pounded a ton of nails through it, turned it upside down, and put it around the edge of the walls. Now, what's that all about? I don't know, but it hurts. Okay? For parents that get up in the middle of the night and step on Legos or Jacks, I'm sure it's something very similar. It wakes you up. Let's move this story along. I got to the point where I started laying down the laminate, right? So I pulled the laminate out of the little little thing, and I went and I said, before I 
tack anything down or get serious about this. Let's just kind of see what it looks like. And so I pushed it up against the edge, and I'm like, well, somebody cut this laminate crooked. Because it starts against the wall here, but by the time it gets down here, there's a gaposis of about three quarters of an inch. And I couldn't figure out what was going on. So I laid down a second piece of laminate against the first one. No, they, they lined up all the way head to toe. You know, you get where I'm going, right? The house wasn't square. The wall wasn't square. It had a bend in it. By the time I was done, it looked like a beaver had come in and gnawed on the laminate in order to make it fit around the corners. Stain covered the mistakes and the holes. Small pieces were interspersed. And where the two pieces, because there was a longer section and then a shorter square section, and I couldn't get it to go smooth all the way across for some weird reason. So I started and built out as far as I could this way, and I started and built this way. (laughs) And I got to the middle and I went, well, that doesn't fit together. How am I going to solve this problem? So I went down to Home Depot and I got a nice little strip that goes on the end and I just popped it right in the middle. And I said, that's good enough for me. Man, I was proud of my job. I got done and I looked at that and I went, there you go. I fixed it. But I was dealing with an unsquare foundation. I didn't understand the problems that I was having. And that happens to us sometimes. Sometimes we allow things as we build in our lives and we allow things in our lives and we get to a point in our life where we're suddenly just slapped inside of the head and going, wait a minute, this doesn't line up. I don't get what's going on. I don't understand. How could I have gotten this far off track? You must have a square foundation, Chip said, because if you start to build, the further you get away from the foundation, the problems begin to exponentiate and they begin to multiply. You have to build on that cornerstone. You know the cornerstone, right? In old time construction, they had to take a square rock that they diligently made 90 degrees Because that was the very first stone that was laid at the corner of the foundation in the building. Because if that stone there was off in any way, shape, or form, then you were off from the get-go. And it was important that you made that cornerstone square. Christ is that cornerstone. We can know and have complete confidence that if we build our lives on Him, we are going to build a square house. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4-8, through 8, Peter says, As you come to Him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God, and precious to Him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, and he goes through and quotes three passages from the Old Testament, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in Him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble. A rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. Christ is that cornerstone. Building your house, building your life on Him, and Him alone, you don't have to worry about getting off. As long as, as you build, you don't allow the society, the culture, to get in and break things apart. And as I said before, we have a society and we have a culture that wants to do that and does a really good job at it. There's an image that I um, have seen and was first presented with a number of years ago, and this image has really struck with me. Now, the context of this image uh, is, is around creationism and evolution. Okay, it, it comes from Ken Ham's Answers in Genesis. But the point is still the same. Look at this image. And I wish I could get it bigger and you could see all the words. I'll try to describe it to you if you can't see it very clearly. We're, we're, 
we're um, presented with two castles, as it were. Yeah, start down there. We're presented with two castles, as it were. Okay, we have we have Christianity flying their flag on the right, and we have humanism flying their flag on the left. Okay. Built on the foundations. On the foundation on this side, we have creation, thousands of years, God's word is truth. The other foundation says evolution, man decides truth, millions of years, so on and so forth. For our purposes here, we're going to say a foundation built on Christ, a foundation built on me, or culture, or whatever. Okay. And the concept they have going on in this picture here is we have Christianity's castle shooting at the things that the world tends to put up. They put up pornography, abortion, let's remove the Ten Commandments, racism, gay marriage, the breakup of families. And we as Christians, we're on board and we're shooting that stuff down. That's no, that's no, that's no, that's no. And that's there's nothing wrong with that. We want to be able to argue against those things and present biblical truth against those things. But look at where the castle of humanism is firing. They're not firing at our flags and our balloons that we put up. They're firing at our foundation. They're they're running out the foundation underneath. And Christianity, if you aren't solid in who you are, I'm not saying that Christianity is going to fall. Christianity will never fall. But I'm saying if you aren't solid, as you're trying to pop the balloons here, you begin to allow adversity to break down your foundation or your walls. And things come into your life and you try to reconcile them, and maybe you give a little here, or you give a little there, and before you know it, you're off kilter. It's the way it was in my life. I shared last night in my testimony. When I, end of high school, early college career, I began to allow the world to influence my thinking. I began to allow it to creep into my life and I tried to reason because I didn't want to hurt anybody else's feelings or because I reasoned with myself ah that's not sin you can do that and be just fine because you're still a Christian and I began to chip away or build things in part of my life that weren't Christ centered and my house began to go cattywampus as it were So we need to make sure that as we build and walk through our lives that we always go back to, if I'm going to add this into my life, does it fit with the squareness of my foundation? Does it fit with my cornerstone in Christ? Thirdly, if you get far enough in the process and you find an error, you can't really fix it up here because this isn't where the error lies. The error lies down low. My wife and I had a great opportunity about two or three weeks ago. We visited uh, Pisa in Italy. And we went to to the Square of Miracles there, and they've got this beautiful, beautifully built baptistry. They've got a gorgeous church that's sitting there. And they've got this cattywampus bell tower that looks like, what happened here? And everybody was looking at that, right? Right? The person who built the Leaning Tower of Pisa didn't call it the Leaning Tower of Pisa. He said, I'm going to build a bell tower. Okay? So he started his construction and then realized very quickly that he was building on a swamp. Now, why he even chose that place in the first place, I don't know. But he began to construct. He got only about a third of the way up before the structure began to fall over. Okay? So you know what he did? He said, I'm going to fix this. And so what he literally did was not tear it down and reinforce the foundation. He goes, I'm going to start building the other way to counteract. This is true. I'm going to counteract the lean. If you ever get a chance to go, it's not the side everybody ever looks at because you got everybody there, you know, with this pose, right?
Are we back? Ah, yes. Thank you, Lord. There's a piece missing. <laughs> Stick it in the pocket. Move on. Recover. Recover. Yeah. Yeah, there it is. Okay. So this is almost the view kind of where I was going that said, if you don't go from the side of the tower that's always leaning, there's a certain side that you can go to, and it's actually not this view. It's if you go stand over here by this red little brick building, you can, you can see the leaning tower do this S curve. Because the guy goes, I'm just going to build the other direction. I'm not going to tear it down to the foundation. True story. You can see it. I got a picture of it. He had just built it and he tried to counteract it, right? Did it work? No. In fact, here's a bit of trivia for you. This isn't the right angle, but if you go up to the side that's leaning over because it's mostly leaning one direction, it actually leans a little bit out towards the left, and you were to drop a plumb line from the railing down to the ground, how far from where that plumb line hits the ground to the base of the thing is it, do you think? 18 feet. I think he kind of goofed. So there it is, right? He should have broken his tower down, had the humility to say, I need to start over. i got to go back to the basics. I'm going to have to rebuild my tower from the bottom up if this is going to be successful in any way, shape, or form. He's successful because of his mistakes. That's not how I want my life to be known. I want my life to be known because I followed Christ. You have to break yourself down to the foundation. Chip also said, you know, when you find the error, the cheapest time in your life to fix something is when you're down here. The cost to break down, fix, and get back to the point sometimes is too great when it comes to building a home. But in our lives... What is the cost sometimes that we often incur having to break ourselves back down in order to get ourselves right with Christ again? I've experienced that cost. I know you have as well in some areas of your life. It hurts. It's a huge cost. And then finally, Chip said, the farther you get from the source, the bigger the problem is. Whoa, is that not truth? The farther you get from the source, the bigger the problem is. He started building his bell tower. He wanted to go this high, and he just kept right on going. The further he got from the foundational truth, the foundational strength, the bigger his problem became. And that's true in our lives as well. Sometimes when we allow those things to come into our lives that we allow to inform us that, that, that aren't of Christ, that aren't of that square foundation, we find ourselves so far away. And you look there and you say, how can I ever make it back? See, the only way he's going to repair his bell tower was to tear it all the way down. But I'm here to tell you this morning, ladies and gentlemen, that it's not that way with us. You see, if we find ourselves too far away, we have the ability to come back to Christ. Yeah, the cost is going to be there. Maybe a little bit painful. But you can come back because Jesus Christ is there and He's saying to you, you may have wandered away a little bit, but I'm right here. Turn around. Come back to me. What was my experience? It was a blessed, wonderful experience. The moment I turned 180 degrees around and I ran back to God. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the gospel message. The simple gospel message of Jesus Christ who says, you're a sinner. I provided a condition for that sin. Come to me. I'll hold you. I'll give you salvation. I'll give you what you long for. There's a current Christian artist out right now who has a brand new released song. His name is Ryan Stevenson. Um, and he has a new song out on Christian radio called The Gospel. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. 
I'm going to ask the, the video team up there, what I have for you is the lyric video, so that as you hear the words, the words of the song are up there as well, So that because sometimes you know you hear a song and you sing the words wrong. I don't ever do that, except every on days that end in Y. But this way you can see the you can see the words that go along. And I want you to listen to the way that he has chosen to write the words of the gospel. Now, um, tech crew up top, when he gets to the end and he just starts repeating the same thing over and over again, I'm going to cut back in, so just kind of fade it out because we don't need to hear it 13 times at the end, all right? But, but listen, to, listen to this video and, and read the words of how Ryan talks about the description of the gospel. We're turning over every stone Hoping to find salvation In a world that's left us cold Can we get back to the altar Back to the arms of our first love There's only one way to the Father And He's calling out to us To the captive it looks like freedom To the orphan it feels like home It's the good news for us all It's greater than religion It's the power of the cross So can we get back to the altar Back to the arms of our first love There's only one way to the Father And He's calling out to us To the captive it looks like freedom To the orphan it feels like home To the skeptic sound crazy to believe in a God who loves in a world where our hearts are breaking and we're lost in the mess we made like a blinding light in the dead of night it's the gospel the gospel that makes a way it's the gospel that makes a way is not that we can receive Jesus into our lives, but that he's already received us into his. In my own life, it means forgiveness when I know I deserve the fall. It called me out of my darkness and carried me to the cross. In a moment, my eyes were open. In that moment, my heart was changed like a blind Isn't that awesome? I love that little interlude in the middle. You know, it's not that the, the good news of the gospel isn't that 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 we can receive Jesus, is that He's already received us. And all we have to do to begin our life and our walk with Him is just to reach out and say, Jesus, I need you. I recognize that I'm a sinner, and I recognize there is no way I'm gonna walk this life by myself. And there's no way I'm going to be able to continue to walk this life unless you walk right beside me. And if you can manage to do that, there's going to come a time when you stand before him at the end and he's going to look at you and he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant, well done. So where are you at this morning?
Examine your life. Have you spent time allowing our culture to creep into your what you think is part of that square foundation? Is there some breaking down that you need to do? Is there some examining that you need to do? If there is, Jesus Christ offers forgiveness from that. Seek out Him. Run to Him. Confess that sin. Ask for the forgiveness. He grants it. And begin building your life around Christ. A solid, strong foundation that is square all the way. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your promises and that you have provided for us in the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that he came and died on the cross for us. And that God, he is that cornerstone, that square, solid foundation that we can rely on 100% of the time through our lives. Thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ and the gospel. In your precious and holy name, amen. Thank you, Jim. What a fine message. What a healthy message for all of us to stop and examine ourselves, and particularly on this day. The first day of the month is the time where we stop and we take time to uh, share the bread and the cup of communion. Uh, I just want to read the passage out of Corinthians for us. Um, Chapter 12, it says, For I received from the Lord... What I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. But Paul continues, he says, Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. He talks to us about examining ourselves, and, and after a message like today, how could we do anything but? As the men come forward, and in a moment we share the bread and the cup. Please hold it and we'll take it, partake it all together. Every week, we have the opportunity to hear the Word presented to us. God's Word, revelation, demands a response by us. We're not just here to listen to good words to tickle our minds. Revelation demands a response. And today's message certainly demands that we stop and examine ourselves. How do we do that? Folks, it's very simple. As we take this calm moment as the elements are passed, as the instruments play, it's a time for you just to simply close your eyes and say, Lord, speak to me. What is that area in my life that you want to reveal to me that maybe my foundation's crumbling a little bit? Maybe there's something I need to do in response to you. If you seek him, he will be found. If you ask, he will speak to you. If in that quiet moment you want to listen. So let us do that today. Let us examine our hearts. Examine our lives before the Lord. Let's listen to him speak to us. Heavenly Father, we thank you today that we have the opportunity and the privilege to gather together with other believers to be strengthened as this community, as this family. We thank you for the word that's been presented to us of Jesus as the cornerstone and and understand that your word demands a response from us. So today, Lord, I just pray that each of us would hear the spirit that dwells within us speak personally in our lives. Father, if there are issues that that we have with others, let us resolve those. If there are issues within our own heart, our own lives, before you, let us be made aware of those and take the steps necessary to correct those so that we can be on a firm foundation, square and true. 
Lord, thank you that we have the opportunity today to partake of the bread and of the cup in remembrance of our Lord Jesus who gave us his body and his blood. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hmm. He took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Father, we thank you for the opportunity for us to just pause, to reflect upon your word, for you to speak into our lives and in our hearts. And Father, today I pray for each one here, but I particularly pray for those who have a troubled heart this morning, where issues in life or difficulties are weighing heavy, that you would give them a sense of your peace, strengthened in their spirit, that you would give them hope, seeing a path for which you want to walk with them. Lord, we just give you thanks that we can come to you and know that you are always there for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Some people would look at this table and could see death and suffering and, and all the things that happened to Jesus. I look at this table and I see love. Um, because only love could motivate God to do what he did for us. Uh, sinners bound for eternal separation from God. Hopeless, helpless, nothing we could do, nothing we could do to redeem ourselves to God without hope. And then God said, there's something I can do. I'll take the penalty for you. That's love. Pure, complete, selfless love. Princes and paupers, sons and daughters, kneel at the throne of grace. Brothers and widows, saints and sinners, one day we'll see his face, and we'll all bow down. Kings will surrender their crowns and worship Jesus. He is the love, unfailing love. He is the love of God. Summer and winter, the mountains and the rivers whisper the Savior's name. Awesome and holy, a friend to the lonely, forever his love will reign and will all will surrender their crowns and worship Jesus. He is the love, unfailing love. He is the love of God. He is the light of the world. He is. 
is the love, unfailing love. He is the love. He's the love of I see the King of glory coming on the clouds with fire. The whole earth shakes, the whole earth shakes. I see His love and mercy washing over all our sin. The people sing, the people sing. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. I see the King of Glory. I see the King of Glory. Coming on the clouds with fire, the whole earth shakes, the whole earth shakes. I see His love and mercy washing over all I sin. The people sing, the people sing.
You can be seated. This on? Is this on? You know, just to let you know that Pastor John tries very diligently to make sure that this is on schedule, and today God blew his schedule clear out of the water. So that's just how it goes sometimes, Um, because we're taking your time. Uh, By the way, I appreciate, Jim, your message, and I appreciate Chip uh, and what he said. He said, do it right. We want to get it right the first time. And I want to thank you guys for your prayers um, and your patience, because we almost did it wrong. And um, thank you to some due diligence on the elders' part, and thank you for the um, the, the blessing of your prayers. We're, we're going to do it right. So uh, it's been a long journey, but we're coming to an end game. So this is wonderful news. Um, this last month, we've had a lot of um, a lot of processing going on. We now have uh, we're t- looking at two wonderful candidates. Both of them are younger. Both of them have families. We're doing reference checks, and we're going to be doing our second interviews with the elders uh, alongside of them. And to alleviate any of your uh, fears and to let you know that we would not break from, or we're not planning on breaking from First Baptist protocol, both of these young candidates are bald. So just wanted to... Okay, so this is a good place to be. But it's also a hard place to be because we can only bring you one candidate. We can only have one senior pastor at First Baptist Church. So I would like to just ask for your prayers again that we, that God make this really clear and really easy when we are in our committee. So far, it's not been easy. And we, we want it to be an easy, clear decision from God. So as we close, I'm going to pray. I want you to pray with me and I'd like you to pray for the next 30 days for this because this is important to us and it's important to all of us here and important to God. (sighs) Father, we, you've asked us to pray for wisdom and we're going to pray for something more. We're going to, we're going to pray that, that you just take over this operation, that you make it really clear and easy to this whole search committee, uh, and to the elders who you want us to bring, uh, to this body to, to show them and present them. We pray that that uh, we can do our due diligence, that we'll do a good job, and that we will we'll get all the support and, and help that we need, and that we will bring you the man that you want us to have. So, Lord, we ask specifically that you make it clear and easy um, for to show us the man that you want us to bring. Thank you so very much. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you again. Have a good day.